So covers, dude? Right. <laughs> Okay, so most of the time we're working on our original music, but we've always played covers. In our early gigs, we probably played half covers and then they got a little bit less and a little bit less. But whenever we approach doing anybody else's music, the biggest thing is, is there a way that we can bring something new to it? Because the idea of playing a cover song and doing it exactly like the original artist doesn't make any sense at all. So what ends up happening is, you know, you have a lot of covers out there and people do these really, really famous Faithful versions, but it's never gonna be as good as the real thing. So you're never gonna match the original. You're never gonna get the vibe and get the recording or any of it correctly the way the original artist did it. So why even try? It makes a lot more sense to deconstruct the song and bring out a different aspect of it. Maybe find something about it that's in the lyrics or that's in the atmosphere of the song that even the original recording didn't really deal with. And I always think of great covers like Joe Cocker doing a little help for my friends. Stuff like that. Or Aretha Franklin doing Bridge Over Troubled Water. Like when you hear stuff like that, you realize that that becomes an essential recording of that song. It's not just trying to be the original. It's actually saying, no, this song has more to say and there's more that you can bring out of it than you ever expected. Plus we love the challenge of taking an already existing awesome song, changing it, whether it's slowing it down, speeding it up, changing the time signature, whatever, and still making sure it's just as awesome as it was in its original form. The stock market today has gone down three points. Check it out, dude. The reason why we do the covers we do is because we're creative individuals. The music we like and the covers we do, the music, they, they're perfect. So if you're gonna do it the same way, then you're just a loser. Why not use your brain, God-given talent, and come with something creative? Ask yourself, do you think the guy that wrote the song, do you think he's gonna like this new cover? And if the answer is yes, then that's what we do. I don't usually do covers, but when I do, we drink a ton of Dos Equis and this music comes out like, wow, like that. No, I'm kidding. We don't usually do covers, but when we do, we do them right. Simple. Another thing we love doing in this band is we love to do cover songs that you really shouldn't do. The sort of don't try this at home concept of doing covers. You know, you find a song that if any band came to you and said, you know, hey, we're thinking about covering X song, your advice to them would be absolutely not. Don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Just hear me out. Just find another song. And those are the ones we should do. Even whole bands that you should avoid if you're doing covers. Chief among them would be bands like Led Zeppelin, Cream, probably a really bad idea. You should never do Santana. You should for sure don't do Pink Floyd. And for the love of God, don't do Steely Dan. Why should you not cover Steely Dan? Because that music is already done perfectly. It's like Bob Marley, you don't cover it. You don't cover that shit. You know, and if you want to do it, you got to make it sound like you wrote it for the first time. I think the trick to do it right is to keep the melody intact, but everything under the melody has to change. And that's what we do. Time-wise, style, style, everything, you know? Genre. We break that rule slightly as well. That's yeah, true. that's the only way to keep it <laughs> together. Takes... Like at the Dodgers. Regarding Steely Dan, in all seriousness, scholarly mode here. You don't you don't mess with Steely Dan because Steely Dan are famous for spending a lot of time perfecting their stuff. I've heard of them spending days and days on end getting the right guitar player, the right solo, trying three different rhythm sections on the same song mixing their records for weeks and weeks on end they didn't have Red Bull in those days so I can't imagine what got them through those mixes oh, I can imagine what got them through those sessions but that's a whole nother block no but the, the point is Steely Dan's meticulous classic albums are sort of that weird rarefied untouchable area so we gravitated towards this one song called Black Friday it's not one of their hits it's the first song off of their 1975 album Katie lied we're not doing your favorite favorite Steely Dan song, but we're doing one of our favorites. We just decided to completely rewrite our approach to the tune, as we always do, and we landed on something that felt so good that now we just want to play this on every gig. What are you doing, Pancho? I have that Steely Dan album here. <sighs> hey. Time for a time lapse. How about that hey. shit? Speaking of covers, just wait. Right, Minky? Heck yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> uh, whatever he said. This is the bomb. Just look at that, trailer park all the way. So our approach to Black Friday was to take this awesome rock shuffle, slow it down, and give it a mysterious swampy feel. In the rock shuffle, you know, you got the shuffling ride pattern, you've got the two and four backbeat. The original beat, I believe, is... 
that kind of thing. It could have been hat. Our approach was stay away from two and four to make it dark. And I primarily use toms for the verses. Adding rim clicks to give it that mystery vibe. So because we don't have a keyboard player, JV and I are always trying to do like what we call the Fender Rhodes guitar bass part where we play very unorthodox guitar and bass parts, right? To supplement the lack of Eli Brueggemann, where do you leave us? The, the, the key, uh, keyboard players. What we're doing right now, I'm just doing really long notes, open E minor seven with a ninth, and then the same voicing with an E. Then it's almost like we have a keyboard player. Play that, let's play that on the one. like this huge harmonic bedding or mattress or, or cover you know <laughs> <It will. laughs> it's huge harmonic cover and then you know the trick is to keep the melody intact so when we do this when moment that we when we hit that A dominant you hear that what I'm doing what I'm doing by myself is this right and Mink what are you doing I'm going and together it sounds like this Keyboard player right there. You know, we're trying to save money. If we could afford a keyboard player. Yeah. yeah. Flying playing that part. Yeah, flying Eli from New York every Saturday is too expensive. Besides, I think he gets paid better by Saturday Night Live. So, you know, that's pretty much what, what we do. And, and then we start moving this pattern because if we keep doing this, the whole song, all y'all are gonna fall asleep. So cranking up the heat, then I change that, that right. and I start moving first, I start moving with the part. guitar, yeah. This is now I'm moving. Little reharm on the fourth time to the G. There's a whole phrase right there. So I'm doing. Then a reharm. That's my whole phrase for the verse. Is established phrase. The kick pattern goes from playing half notes and it starts playing quarter notes. Right. And then it just, the whole momentum picks up. So even though we're still kind of implying a halftime feel, now rhythmically you're getting a lot more notes. The next part of this tune is probably the most faithful part to the original, which mm -hmm. we didn't really mess up. We obviously don't go into a fast shuffle. And it's also because but it's we a just... part that is so strictly tied to the melody that it's hard to do something else. Right. We even sing, attempt to sing the Steely Dan harmonies more or less over it, which yeah. is unusual for us to do. But when you get to the chorus, at any time a guitar player has an opportunity to play this type of thing. So now we are, we're implying two and four. We're rocking out, but it happens for a little moment, and right back into our dark vibe. Yeah, yeah. and we don't, you don't, we don't quote the. We don't quote that. So it goes. Don't let it fall. 
And now, now that we've gone through the beef, after that we'll just repeat what we've done and then we jump into what Dig Infinity calls the Anaconda. What's that? You gotta know about the Anaconda. <laughs> to understand this band, this is a key concept. Yeah. In almost every arrangement we have, there's a moment where we either start to get bored or our blood sugar caffeine levels are <laughs> suboptimal or something happens where we realize that we can't just keep playing the song. So the Anaconda is when the unpredictable happens. Yeah, I guess in a nutshell, and, you could, for yeah. you music types, you could consider it a bridge, but it's like a bridge on steroids. And luckily for us, being so close to the border, we can get the real Mexican Coke, man. You know, you know, when you're falling down, you need, you need some Coke. Just say no to drugs. Oh. So yeah, so a lot of times when we go into this Anaconda section, we Get love it. to kind of almost Latinize the music. Salsa, any kind of Latin genre you can think of. It's really easy for us to go there. But for this song, I wanted it to feel like it was this dude who lived in the swamp playing his version of a Latin beat. So it wasn't going to be full on tumbao on the kick. This guy who lived in the swamp would probably just kind of be grooving out to quarters, you know? Right? He'd have a cowbell. And then everything on top is going to be the Latin stuff. To me, it's actually easier when the drummer is going able like that because I have to play less. So it's actually better. Uh, the less I play, the more I make. If, if Paul is going that's what my like my my common brain is listening to this so I'm like I need to open it up to make it breathe so what I'm doing with your little uh, beat give me like a, just a little click okay. initially we were just doing it we were bamping it on the B on the E on the B. But it became a little monotonous because we're nerds. We decided to add more changes to a song that has already like 20 million changes. So, so now what we added is E, G, B flat, right? And then C, and then B, and then back, right? Second time, G, B flat, and then C, and then E flat diminish. Substituting the five, right? We play this, play back to the one. So that's a whole line. So now with the groove, it'll sound like this. And it intertwines with his line. You know, like there's little lines that get together. Like I do. But right here, I do this little bending that he's doing with me. So it it kind of like we're playing, and then sometimes we're playing together, and then we split up, and then it creates like these beautiful long phrases. With this groove going, you just don't want to stop it. Once yeah. it gets going, you don't actually want to do that much to it. So instead of going into a normal solo, I just ended up playing like almost like a rhythm guitar solo. Mm -hmm. But then that got old after a second, and so then we just went full out like weedly deedlies. <laughs> And then the Weedly Deedlies to Weedly Deedlies, there, Deedlies you'll, 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 along. You'll hear that in the, in the final yeah. real version. That's kind of the tune, except we did write one more section to this song. The question the people, uh, viewers might be asking is, how do you go from this <laughs> back, back how do we connect? into the dark, swampy... That's something how we're do forgetting. We, yeah, how I mean, do we do look, that? Another, oh, no, I know. We do the another, chorus. Listen, yeah. we, we forget to tell them that another really important detail that, that we pay when we do our 
a little crazy covers is the connectors the part connectors you know how do we connect because we're changing a lot of stuff so we have to find creative ways to connect these new changes and make them make sense with AKA, the song uh, transitions transition we call them slingshots we call them yeah there's all yeah. kinds of terms we call them yeah. pacoima 2000. <laughs> pacoima 2000 is a feeling as soon as you play your song this is what happens if you get a pacoima 2000 feels like this you play the song you know doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, you finish you're like Pacoima 2000. That's like that, and you just like dazed and confused into the horizons because you have these feelings. <laughs> that is Pacoima 2000, and that's exactly where he was born. The next little thing that we snuck in here, this one goes out to Mr. Donald Fagan himself because we love to quote our other favorite songs from the same band somewhere in the song. Does that make sense? So Easter like, egg. Easter <laughs> egg. Wait, am I going the right way? Easter, Easter egg. So in this tune, he gets to the big ending of that stuff and then... <laughs> A different Steely Dan tune. Name that tune. So he's doing that, the, the Steely Dan song, and I did part of the original lead vocal melody. And then I go. And then we go back into the verse. So and whatever. she brings you only sorrow. We were saying that, you know, that little transition, a uh, uh, chorus, doom, boom, boom, I kinda, everybody brought the heat up a little bit. What do you do on the last chorus that's different? I just go. Like a Tom Petty yeah. solo. And then what do you do that is different for the last chorus? You just bring the intensity yeah, up? Yeah, the intensity's up. We're, we're almost, we're definitely in playing two and four at this point now. Yeah. So it's yeah. full on rock. Just rock Cause what out. I'm doing on the, on the normal chorus, I'm like, man, blah. This one I go. Uh, uh, uh. One, two. So that, that's basically it. But the big ending, my eight-year-old kid likes to say, Dad, all your songs end the same. And I said, thank you. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. <laughs> no, but you know what he means? He means this kind of thing. We always got to put a big riff at the end. Curve my off. son, watch and learn. <laughs> because that is exactly right. So at the end of this tune, we just wanted to go off. The chords, which go... Kind of, except I screwed one of them up. But then we decided to kick it up a notch. That part so funky <laughs> that you forgot it. Yeah, I totally. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, that the goal, the goal is to achieve Pacoima 2000 during that riff at every gig. Absolutely. At the last one when we did that, Pacoima 2000 was absolutely happening. I mean, I felt it. The audience felt it. The bartender felt it. Felt it. If you can make the bartender talk about your band, because they're jaded, dude. dude they that, no, they see the him come and they see him they go. See the bouncer. The bouncer came in and they've seen and heard everything go through that bar, club, whatever. So we knew it was hot. Yeah. <laughs> Get the seal of approval. That's Woo! right, dude. Respect. 
Yeah, that was at the the Mint. That's that's a famous bar in LA. Well, now I hope you guys know how to make a cover a la Dig Infinity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so gear for this tune, there's no doubt that this was the right guitar for it. This is a GNL ASAT Special Semi Hollow Hollow Body Guitar, beautiful big chunky GNL MFD pickups. And uh, the reason that I went with it was because I needed to get a really warm sound for the verse, and then a really bright, brash, twangy sound for the chorus, and kind of an in-between sound. So for the beginning. <laughs> that and that's a very specific so here's the warm sound for the verse and then for the chorus you got this oh yeah it's got a ton of attitude so that's why that's why this guitar. For the amp, I went with my Mesa Lone Star Special. This is a low watt amp. The highest it goes is 30 watts, but I have it in the five watt setting because I want it to sound like a very small amp that's about to explode. And most amps, you can't do that unless they are really tiny amps that you're overdriving. This one is doing the thing. I have a tremolo, you know, an old fashioned, an old fashioned amp tremolo sound. <laughs> recording I'm, I'm using software for it so that I can change the amount at different points throughout the song. Here's a cool trick when when you want to get the old amp sound and you don't have an old amp the tremolo sound has to be after the reverb so if you go like this you can hear it going so the old amp sound they would always put the tremolo circuit after the reverb I don't know why they did it but it became a thing and so now whenever I hear that old sound I want to hear the reverb going like that so so that's this and it sounds great and then I, I go to channel 2 for the really dirty parts and I get rid of the, the the tremolo and I get rid of the echo and get a real dirty thing by maxing it out and just really having a lot of uh, a lot of grease so you end up with this kind of thing. that all day. I was kind of thinking about Joe Walsh. I wanted to get like a Joe Walsh type of sound. I'll play a Joe Walsh-esque. So this is a Joe Walsh-ish Walsh-ish riff. <laughs> trying not to play the actual song. That's that. Right guitar. Right amp, that's what Keith Richards used to say. You just need to find the right guitar for the right amplifier. Paul had his Gretsch drums as always. They don't look as cool without the cymbals, as you can see, so let's just, let's not talk about that. And Poncho, <laughs> for his part, just like me, GNL and a Mesa. He's got this wonderful tube head here, Bass Prodigy. And we recorded this with a blue bottle rocket microphone and another track through this A Designs Ready DI box. And he played this guy, which I do believe is the L1000 in Ferro Gold Mist. Oh yeah. It's Pretty just nice. it's just too sexy, you know, for a bass. So that's what we used on this. It worked out really, really great. We're very happy with the tone of this bass head. It just totally rips. That's the tones. That's what that's what we did with this one. So, so we hope you enjoyed our breakdown of our Steely Dan cover for Black. Black Friday and we really see ourselves as part of a, a lineage of older musicians, middle-aged musicians and younger musicians that are all kind of in this long story. So it makes a lot of sense for us to revisit a lot of our favorite bands and our favorite songs and just kind of see what comes out of it. So I hope that was meaningful for you guys. It was really good fun for us. And of course, you must subscribe to our YouTube channel and our other social channels. We are Dig Infinity. We love the support and the comments and all that stuff. So thanks for being with us.